Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sandy Shugart. As Dr. Shugart prepares to retire, today we recognize his outstanding community service as a leader. He has served since 2000 as the fourth president of Orlando's Valencia Community College, now Valencia State College. Such colleges play a crucial role across the country in fostering social mobility for students and developing talent for their communities. As winner of the first Aspen Prize for Excellence, Valencia is one of the most celebrated community colleges in America. The Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence honors those institutions that strive for and achieve exceptional levels of success for all students while they were in college and after they graduate or transfer. Serving some 70,000 students each year, Valencia is known for high rates of graduation, transfer, and job placement, and has become something of a national laboratory for best practices in learning-centered education. We are proud that the Rotary Club of Orlando Foundation will sponsor six scholarships to Valencia this year. Prior to Valencia, Sandy served as president of North Harris College and as vice president and chief academic officer of the North Carolina Community College System. He has earned his PhD in teaching and learning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition to his career in education, Dr. Shugart is a published poet, a songwriter, and author of a book entitled Leadership in the Crucible of Work, Discovering the Interior Life of an Authentic Leader. Please give Dr. Shugart a warm literary welcome. Thank you. I'm honored. I feel like I should have joined this club. I've been here so many times and eaten your fine lunches. Fresh flesh with you. And it's, it's good to be back with you. Uh, and thank you for this a simple honor. And we appreciate it. So I was asked to bring you a little bit of an update on the college with a, a focus on maybe looking back a little bit on 20 years, a little more than 20 years of work there. And, uh, and forward for me, what am I going to do next? So I broke the so I'll, I'll be happy to make a few comments about that. The college is doing very well. Uh, higher education in general may not, may not be doing very well, but Melissa's is doing quite well. There's been about a 15% contraction in the higher education workforce nationally. And among community colleges in particular, uh, a nearly 20% reduction in enrollment over the past couple of years, largely driven, but not entirely driven by, uh, by the pandemic. I think uh, many institutions, traditional and non-traditional, are struggling to reinvent themselves into a 21st century model of blended services and education that treats persons differently. This is the key word, person. For 45 years, I guess, maybe 50, the American Higher Education Project has been about building. And presidents and boards, and their teams have been rewarded for being builders. Build buildings, build the enrollment, build the endowment, build the reputation, build the brand, build, build, build. And you all know, as alumni of institutions, that they feel incredibly entitled to everything at your disposal. David Joyce is moving the camera. How many of you have been solicited by your alma mater? <laughs> it's an extraordinary thing. It's raised many billions of dollars. Uh, and I honor the culture of building. I think there was a time when building was the thing. But you know, to be human is to be an idolater. To be human is always to find a way to substitute the form for the substance, isn't it? Building had a purpose at one time. Now they're just building because they can. Raising endowments made sense at some time. Now they raise money because they can. My own alma mater approached me several years ago. I love the University of North Carolina. 
I bleed blue. I have four degrees. My wife has two. You know, that's home for us. And they were in their third multi billion dollar campaign. And they named it Carolina First. You can imagine the audacity, the hubris in that statement. And some nice young thing called and said, we know we can count on you like we always have. And I said, you can count on me to tell you the truth. And the truth is I'm not in. I'm not in. And she said, why? And I said, it doesn't really matter. I'm just not in. So her boss called me. And I told him, I'm not, I'm not in. Why? This doesn't matter. Finally, his boss called me. I knew I wouldn't go any further than that. I don't give enough to get me on that. But he called and I said, let me be plain with you. I don't know why you need the money. And I know a lot of people do. In Carolina, I'm sorry, it's a first. It's not a second. It's not tenth. It's not thousandth. It's a fine institution. But you're self-centered, and I can't support it anymore. The ego is, and, and that's just astonishing to me. The entitlement. What's wrong? And what's at the bottom of that? At the bottom of that is the wrong anthropology. Working anthropology. But most institutions of higher education today is that human beings were made for them, not them for the human beings. What the anthropology, what people actually experience as persons in most institutions, is to become a number. In a large institution, you're the magnetic strip on the back of the card, you're an enrollment. You're an FTE, an FT, you know what that means? Full-time equivalent student. You're an FTE, it's how funding, it's how the business model works. And the business model has become the mission. There's so many institutions. I welcome the trouble that we're having now. I think it's a chance to re-examine Once it's had in the industry, Trust me, I, I, this is not my work. I was privileged to be part of a very large team of people who turned an institution into something extraordinary. I was a part of it. I loved being a part of it. I'll never forget it, but it wasn't me. We have, we have the highest graduation rates, the highest transfer rates, the highest success rates, student success rates in the industry. It's the best. Hear us talk about it. You'll never hear us talk about it down. You'll never hear us talk about our building of ourselves. There's a story to tell this, but it's not a story. And the, the center of that culture is an anthropology. I mean, the faculty sometimes I'll say every pedagogy implies an anthropology. What's yours? And I'll get a blank look usually the first time. I say, you know, everything you do as a teacher, the way you treat those students, the way you think about learning, if you haven't deeply examined what it means to be human, what it means to be a human adult, what it means to be a human adult learner, and built your practice out of that deep examination, then you're a technician. Not a professional. What's the anthropology? So let me explain ours in a nutshell. And at the end of the day, there's only two ways, I think, all the philosophy I've studied, only two fundamental ways to look at the universe. One says, look around you. Everyone you see will be gone in a minute. We're temporary. We all die. And it happens so fast. So what must matter is the legacy you leave behind. The wealth you accumulate, the poetry you write, the communities you build, the civilization you support. That's what must matter. Philosophy is called materialism. 
And it's really winsome. It calls out to us because we know our own mortality. We're all in touch with that. The problem is you can justify almost any harm to other human beings on the basis of some legacy you care about. That's the problem with materialism. By looking at the universe, says, look around. Everything you see is temporary. The second law of thermodynamics can't be thwarted. Entropy is real. Everything decays. Except in some way that we can't quite explain, the person sitting across from you. us entertains at some point in his life the hypothesis that there's something about personhood that's permanent when nothing else is. All this personalism, if you want to. If you want to read part of it, go back and find the philosophy of Josiah Royce at the turn of the century, the alternative to pragmatism. But I'm dangerously close to lecturing you now. I say about professors, they talk in other people's sleep. <laughs> Persons, if the universe, the small p, maybe even a capital. How does that play itself out in your business, in your family? your neighborhood, your politics, to play out in an institution like ours. I'll give you an example. Years ago, we were doing an identity study at, at Valencia. This is where you hire a consultant who blindly goes out into the community and interviews people and says, you know, to find out what the community thinks of you. And then they interview people inside the organization to find out what you think of yourselves. And then they hold the two pictures up to see if they're at all similar. It's meant to shock you into a sense of reality about your, your image and brain. At the time we were trying to decide on a name change, that seemed like a reasonable thing to do. This consultant interviewed 70, 80 people in the community and 30 or 40 inside the college. I was her last interview, last one. So we met. She asked her questions. Her final question was, what do you think it is about Valencia that makes it special? And I thought for a minute, I said, I guess it's the people. It's an extraordinary community of people. And she wrote it down and said, thank you. And then she closed her head and uh, sort of breathed a deep breath and said, well, that's it, I'm done. I said, really? And she said, yeah, you were my last interview. And I said, so what do you think? And she said, well, I'd like to work here. Was she really why? She said, because I've never been any place it was clearer about what they were doing in the world. Your alignment is amazing. And I said, well, what was you know, the last question you asked? What was the right answer, the best answer to that question? What makes us special? And she grinned and said, well, it wasn't yours. <laughs> so what was it? She said, there were two faculty in here just ahead of you, and they both gave the same answer, and it's the best answer. What makes Valencia special isn't that the people are amazed is that the students are amazing. How many of you heard a faculty member say their students are amazing? They're amazing. Most institutions are certain they're amazing. And that's why the students should attend there to get a little taste of their amazingness. These two faculty said, no, no, no. It's the students who are amazing. And they're right. Our students are amazing. So is everyone else's. The human, particularly if you believe in this personalism rather than materialism, to be human is to be special, to be amazing, to be transcendent, to be eternal. And our job is to call that out of them, even when they don't know it's there. You see that? 
See how different that anthropology is than a, than a FTE or a donor or a source of revenue or even a pupil. The difference between Valencia and other institutions is we know they're a business. We know they are. When you approach other human beings with reverence, the fact you give changes their experience. And who they are. This is the secret of your work at the Salvation Army. This is every good missionary knows this. They approach other cultures and people reverently. Great bosses hold their employees in sort of a reverent attitude. It creates a kind of respect, doesn't it? Great teachers revere their students. It doesn't mean they they hold them in high regard for what they know. They hold them in high regard for what they can do. They can be. A sociologist friend who says, coherent communities are formed around objects of common love. These are formed around objects of common love. Those objects can be things, but more often they're ideals. Encourage reverence. The opposite of reverence, by the way, is not irreverence. The opposite of reverence is hubris. Five. Reverence is the cardinal virtue that keeps us from trying to act either like little gods or beasts. Now, reverence, you're hardly human. What's made the points of difference is that people from all kinds of perspectives, lots of countries, lots of different language groups, different religions, no religion at all, have treated our students consistently with reverence. And when someone doesn't, they're called out. What if our whole community was that? What if institutions like Rotary, at their core, we're about creating reverence for the objects of common love, the things we care about most. What if cooperation across boundaries of race and social class and faith, those things could be bridged with reverence. It's a virtue worth cultivating. And I think that's been at the core of who the list really is. That said, it will be um, a very mixed pleasure to finish my tenure of 22 years almost on July 1st. And uh, I hope to reach July 2nd completely spent. A bag of nothing, having given it all. And then I'll figure out what I'm going to do next. Um, but it was the right time for me to, to move on. I have the team there is extraordinary. And I thought, um, and there was some turnover coming in the team. And I thought, I don't want to hire my successors to. Whoever that person is needs to be able to hire their own team. Um, and it was a right decision. I got other stuff I can do. So uh, it's actually a year or two ahead of my schedule, but I stepped out a little early. The board conducted the service for the fall. They hired the provost of the college, Dr. Kathleen Plinsky, who was a wonderful, amazing, almost magical human being. She's really something. And she'll take the college places I could never have imagined. She starts July 2nd. Um, just, uh, again, I hope you'll befriend her and connect her with you. Um, she has been president of our Osceola, Poinciana, and Lake Nona campuses combined and did that while serving as provost as well. Her capacity for work is pretty extraordinary. She'll be happy to get back with just one job. I think, but, um, but do do invite her to connect. She'll be great here. I will be leading the community. I think it's probably probably ought to be a law that when the college president serves for a long time, he should move at least three states away when he retires, uh, just to give room for the next person to lead freely. So we'll be moving to North Carolina sometime in the in the coming year, probably in the fall. 
um, in the area of Winston-Salem. That's my mother-in-law's close to her home. She was almost 92 and in good health. And we thought, let's take her. She lived with us for more than 20 years. Well, we take her where she could have her best years uh, for the next few years, close to all of our family. And uh, I, meanwhile, will have some other things to do. We have old farm cabin up in uh, about 4,000 feet in the mountains of Virginia where we're going to grow some apples, blueberries, and that sort of thing. Uh, I have uh, uh, a part-time job as a senior fellow for the Aspen Institute mentoring young college and university presidents around the country. And I'm a scholar with the Quo Vadis Institute in Europe. And uh, spent a fair amount of time when traveling was possible in Eastern Europe in particular, helping them figure out what their objects of common love are so their societies can flourish and support one another. So that's my story. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions or engaging conversation. And I thank you again for making me a part of your family. Thank you, Dick. He's going to repeat the question for you when he starts answering. Can I comment on, on any differences between the students we had 22 years ago when I first arrived here um, or compared to those we have today? So, uh, you know, I, I think I would say that in every respect that matters, they're not very different. Um, the, the diff there are differences, but they tend to be cultural kind of surface differences that you can get next. They're the things you see and notice when you first walk in a room. Once you get to know them, those things sort of disappear. Um, so I, I think it's really easy to pass kind of cultural judgment generation to generation on folks. I would say um, the students we have now are much more facile with certain tools. Fine. Uh, their, um, their means of building community and connecting are different in my mind. Uh, and faculty have to be mindful of, of how community is built with students who have a much more extensive community of leaders than we ever had. Uh, but their, their fundamental motivations are not different. So, you, you know, my deep background is in brain science, it's in cognitive neuroscience. And uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, phony science about the brain because it sells books right now. So you can, you can write about almost anything and put the word brain in it and a publisher will say, oh, I'll publish it. Uh, almost all of it's fake science. We know so little. The brain's still such a black box, for the most part. But there's a lot of junk around about how the brain's rewiring itself because of the use of technology and so forth. I think that's um, not supported by evidence. It's an interesting speculation. What I do think is true um, is that our culture has become less reverent more materialistic. Um, and I think it's a culture that, uh, that the younger people are inheriting from us. So if, if you tell somebody frequently enough and authoritatively enough that they are that magnetic strip on the back of a car, they'll behave that way eventually. They'll believe you eventually. And that's what we've done. It was my generation and my parents' generation, some of your generation, that commercialized the hell out of everything and turned persons into customers in every walk of life. But, uh, I can tell you in higher education, you couldn't find a more impoverished anthropology than customer. You think about that. A customer writes a check and gets a product. In our work, what would be a better analogy? A student for us is more like a software developer. And they come to us, our little company, 
of Valencia. So we help make sure they're writing good software. We teach them how to write better software. We evaluate and give them feedback on software. And the software they're writing is up here. They're more like knowledge workers than they are customers. If you want to have you know, a business analogy for students, oh, there's so much more than that. Dreams, trajectories, and destinies, and hopes, and fears, and trauma, and all. I mean, the, the whole person comes to school. It's not a customer. We taught them to behave that way. And so sometimes you will see students behave like stomp their feet. I paid my money, I want my grade. As it feels like education is the only commodity people want less of for their money. I school this week, it's raining. It just feels that way sometimes. We taught them that. It's our job to unteach that. I'll repeat the question. This is from Khalid. So Khalid's asking what changes we made to accommodate to the pandemic that might end up being long-term uh, changes for the college. So a year ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was, we were on spring break, I was on vacation. And we saw what was going down. In fact, I was in Seattle, now that I think about it. I was in Seattle at a conference. And on Sunday morning, I got up, read the newspaper, and watched the television, and they were talking about this crazy outbreak at the local nursing homes in Seattle. And it was this new virus, this coronavirus. And I thought, if I don't get out of here, could accomplish right until Wednesday. If I don't get out of here, I'm not getting out of here. So I caught a Sunday afternoon plane. And Tuesday, they came to the airport. On Tuesday, I had a conference call here with all of our leaders, and we said, we're going to delay coming back from spring break by a week. It gives us 10 days. And we converted the entire course catalog. We have about 6,000 courses at any given time. They're being offered sections. About 2,000 of them were already online about a third of what we do. So we had another 4,000 classes and we had 10 days to move them all online. And the faculty did, it was, just, it was amazing to watch. Uh, and so remote learning, and then we also had to convert all services to remote. So we had never done remote work for say financial aid, and business office, and all those sorts of things. So all that had to be converted to. So we sent everybody home, equipment, computers, and began to, to put tutoring online, and, Advising on all those functions. We got a train coming up. It was extraordinary to watch it all happen. And you know, at that point, you, you make your hard decisions to go, and then deep down in the college, you know how to go. It was like a train barreling down the track. What will last from all that? Here's the thing that will last. We have a unique experience. This, this is another illustration of this sacred anthropology. About four or five weeks into all this, my team looked at one another and said, you know, what matters most in this is what the students are experiencing, and we don't know. We've, they didn't select this modality. They didn't ask for this to happen. But their educations have been disrupted. Let's call them. I said, who are you going to call? The students. All of them. One who was enrolled in a face to face class that got moved online got a phone call from a staff member at the college to say, How are you doing? How's this working for you? Can I help you with anything? And then they got into conversations like, I'm thinking about dropping. They said, Don't drop. Hang in there as long as you can. If you do, have an unsuccessful experience in this class, we'll let you, we'll, we'll wash it off your record, we'll let you take the class again in the fall or in the summer for free. Put it off. Because they're persons. It's personal. Since that time, the team has made over 100,000 contacts, personal contacts with students to say, how are you doing? Some of them are targeted to groups that we know are struggling, some of them just Open calls, everybody gets touched. 
does that result in? Well, we know what we know who we are. We're living into our anthropology. But also did this. There are 28 state colleges in Florida. 27 of them lost enrollment this past year. Fifteen or twenty percent. We grew. The relationship. So I you know, figuring out how to how to use technology to personalize rather than depersonalize, I think is the best answer, Cody. We're learning again and again. You can use the technology a lot of ways. You can treat people as objects, as populations, as as centers of revenue. There's all sorts of ways to treat people. But you can also use technology to say, I see you. Tell me your story. How can I be helpful to you? I don't want to use you. I want to, I want to walk with you. How's he doing? That's wonderful. And Say it again, what came out? Tom Kenny. So, um, for an autodidact, an advanced learner, online is fine. You know, I wrote curriculum for many doctoral programs, and they're essentially reading lists and big questions. You know, in the doctoral program, you read scores of books and articles, scores and scores of them, and then you synthesize them and you formulate a view of your profession or whatever it is you're working on. That works just as well really online if you can have conversation with other scholars. And so you build in that conversation. I think um, the, the wonderful thing about the past year is that we thought of Zoom and other technologies like that as little tools that you use for staff meetings. We have Zoom meetings, scores of them every day, and we have in many ways improved engagement, connection, contribution and collaboration in the organization tenfold over driving between campuses all over creation to have meetings where you spend more time on the road than you do in the conversation so there's a lot of good that's coming out of again, using technology that treats people as persons but for a lot of learning those tools aren't especially helpful so math is a great example math is a foreign language the language. Once you crack the code, a lot of math becomes very easy. Americans, almost uniquely in the world, don't get this. There's something about our education system that disables people's capacity to do mathematics. I don't know what it is. It's not like this in any country in Europe, I know. Uh, but I trust, you must trust me on this. Everybody in this room has the biology required to learn calculus. And two thirds of you have said recently, I'm not a math person, but you have biology to do that. It's just another language and cracking the code. And that's best done in community where that communication is free flowing. Now, if the model of instruction is a lecture, you might as well do it all. If the model of instruction is engagement and it's hard to, harder to do online than it is face to face, especially for basic learners, learners who are not yet either autodidacts. The good news is tools like Khan Academy, and there are many others. There's one here, right here in, 
in Winter Park that does amazing math tutorials. It's just a project from a guy who's successful. Um, they are not supplanting traditional instruction, they're adding to it, they're supplementing. I use them. Um, and it's changed everything. YouTube's changed everything. You wanna, you, you have a project to do at home. If you're not my age, the first thing you do is go to YouTube. It never occurs to me until I'm in trouble in the project. I still go to YouTube. My kids go to YouTube like that. Oh yeah, I know how to do that. Let me show you how to change the battery. I'll watch it on YouTube, Dad. It's more reliable than you. I learned. I mean, I'm a guitarist. I'm a really serious musician. I play in certain genres. If I want to go to a different genre, so I play. Uh, I don't play a lot of jazz. The jazz chord progressions are really different. So it's almost like learning a whole new instrument. On YouTube, there's thousands and thousands of good tutorials where you learn your links and chains. Um, so, you know, it's, it's become more supplemental than, than replaceable. It's largely a good thing. Ken Chapman is talking to him, so hold on. I don't think he's asking a question, he's just thanking him for what he does. Thank you again. Uh, it's called Accelerated Skills Training. Now we're up to about 1,200 a year. We'd like to get to about 5,000 a year. These are people who earn industry certifications in a matter of a few weeks that lead to very high paying jobs. Let me give you two examples. I met a young man about this time last year um, who had just graduated from Valencia. And I said, well, what'd you graduate in? He said, power lining. I said, I have to hear your story. So he said, well, you know, I was a football star at Olympia High School. I had scholarship offers to some smaller colleges, but I told my dad, I, I just, I'm not an inside guy. I just don't want to go to foreign classes. I need to do something outdoors. So dad said, you're on your own. And I found this program and I was trained to be a power lineman in 15 weeks. All outdoors, it's, you know, it's pretty serious stuff. You can get electrocuted pretty easily out there. I said, well, how's it worked out for you? He said, I got a job the day before I graduated with Florida Power Line. I make $25 an hour to start, and I drive the coolest truck you ever saw. <laughs> and I said, $25, that's $50,000 a year. And all he says, does a lot more than that because it's time and a half for overtime, and there's lots of it, and storm pay is triple time. And every year you can take a test to get an additional certification. And on your fifth, by the time you get your fifth certification, you make $50 an hour. I said, how much do you expect to make this year? He said, mm, best guess about 80,000, a 15 week program out of high school. Right? This, is the, this is the missing blue collar class that built the middle class in America. Those jobs are still there. You just have to connect people to them. Another example, this is a young woman came to us. We put her, we put her through our construction program of seven weeks. Uh, she got a job uh, right out of that, making about $12.50, $13 an hour. She had been making $8.50 as a bar maid or something, I forget. Uh, so she went to work for the actually for the, the firm that's building the, the last phase of the Dr. Phillips Center. And she went to $12.50, $13 an hour. She sent me a photograph. On, in an email about nine months ago, this is her with her helmet, all her gear on, standing on top of the steel superstructure for the new part of the Dr. Fulton Center uh, with her welding gear. And she said, uh, I've made it to some class of construction worker and making $80,000 a year. Seven week program. It took her a year to get there. And she worked hard, I'm sure, and earned every every one of the accolades that got her promoted, but there are jobs there for people. You know? We're never gonna get rid of low paying jobs in, in, in Florida, not here. Never gonna get rid of them. But people will have to be in the permanent. 
It's okay to start at $10 now. It's not okay to stay at $10 now. They ought to move through those jobs and on to jobs that can sustain a family. And they're out there if they can train enough of them. And the, the employers are dying for them. Our, our truck driving school is besieged with employers. Our welding school is besieged with employers. Construction, transportation and logistics, uh, manufacturing. They have 11 certificates in manufacturing. Everybody gets hired. Everybody gets. Alan Schaefer has a question. I'm assuming 22 years ago, oh, you had a mentor. The question is. Uh, as I mentor young presidents, what's the best advice I can give to a new president or a new senior leader that I'm mentoring? And the answer to that is very straightforward. Um, the most in-demand capacity is self-awareness. Skills, whether you're whether you're accounting and finance or, or engineering or or education or whatever they might be, technical skills are easily acquired. It's just a matter of a little time or a little effort. There's nothing mysterious about that. The human heart is where the mystery is. The human ego. So skilled skilled leaders who are not self-aware are just dangerous. Self-aware leaders can always get skilled. So, uh, you know, and what you do every day, particularly if you're handling the tools of power, is changing. All of Greek tragedy, no, study that if you want. All of Greek tragedy is about people in power who forget that they're just people. Use their self-awareness. Hubris takes over and they're headed for a big fall. Agamemnon, Oedipus, Theseus, you name them all. Yes. Sandy, I have one question for someone online, and it is how do you replicate the success of Valencia around the country and change the mindset of the institutional university system? So, um, <clears throat> Uh, the question is, uh, can, can what we do be replicated? And I'd say yes, and I'm very involved in that. That's what my work with the Aspen Institute's all about. So they're identifying and training up a new generation of leaders and then nurturing them through their early stages of their first presidency to be leaders of impact for the mission of those colleges. And at the core of that is, is building a culture uh, that is genuinely learning and student-centered rather than self-centered institution. I do that mostly in open access institutions over the two-year, four-year, because they're less, less entangled in their own egos. Um, I, my, you know, I have a hope for the more elite institutions, but they're caught up in a, an enterprise that's very hard to reform. And it's getting harder every year. So just major college athletics, for example, is a giant corrupt entertainment industry. And we're all part of it. Every one of you that's got orange and, and uh, green and garnet and gold, you're all part of it. It's deeply corrupt. Deeper than you can possibly imagine. And, and I don't know how it ever gets reformed. The president's tried 25 years ago and failed. I don't know how it ever gets solved. Um, you know, the, the whole notion of merit exclusion, higher education, elite higher education has become a very powerful tool for replicating tax differences from generation to generation. That's what it does. And it's the disruptive institutions like Valencia that almost have any hope of changing that. So every time we transfer students from Valencia to UCF, we're, we're, we're making a shot at it. We double their diversity. Fourth of their students come from Valencia. We double their diversity. 
you know, I'm sure it's much more in the economic perspective. So, um, you know, if, if the promise of higher education that it creates a level playing field is ever to be fulfilled, and I can argue it never has been, but if it's ever to be fulfilled, it's probably going to happen because of disruptive institutions. So I'm focused on the ones who are capable of creating disruption. And hardly anybody disrupts their own successful business. Um, so I'm not working with the Harvards and the Carolinas of the world, but more with the Valencias and, and uh, Austin Community College and, and so on. Thank you. Well, you've been wonderful. I can maybe take one more. We're probably out of time, are we? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so we did have uh, years or so of college's history. Um, I think there were four major sports, basketball, baseball. The question was about athletics. Uh, volleyball and softball. And uh, my answer to that would be that's... Uh, uh, it was discontinued in 1998. It was very expensive and touched very few students. And uh, the students financed it. Um, and so we asked the students, this is a, an unusual thing. The college went to the students and said, this is how you want your money invested. And they said, not, not really. Um, and we said, well, what, what would you want to invest in? And they said, you know, we like to learn more. If you could provide more robust tutoring and learning support services, we'd rather have that. And so a fourth of the student activity dollars, by their discretion, and we ask them to vote on this every year in student government, a fourth of the dollars collected from student activity go back into supporting their learning, which has a much higher return on investment than junior college athletics. <laughs> but almost every year, somebody approaches me in fact, two days ago, and says, have I got a deal for you? It won't cost you a thing. You can have athletics. Look what it's going to do for you. And by the way, I'd like to be the coach. <laughs> there are apparently a lot more eager coaches than there are athletes. <laughs> you guys have been great. I appreciate the honor and appreciate the Thank you, Dr. Shugart. What an enlightening talk. I think if, if you listened as I did, that he just gave us a model for growing this Rotary Club into a largest, uh, much larger than it currently is. So thank you for that. And thank you for your insights. And thank you for your almost 22 years of true leadership that, in this community. Now, next week, we have uh, Dr. Eric Hoffman from UCF talking about genetics and the conservation of Florida's wildlife. And we're gonna have a special guest next week. That guest is Carter Nouse, who is, as you recall, Carter spent the first 125 days of his life in the hospital struggling for survival. He's now reached one year old and is a healthy, beautiful young man. So we'll see him next week. And then in two weeks, we'll have uh, Dr. Al Nasif uh, talking to us about the importance of cybersecurity. So since we are a business club, remember to do business with Rotarians. And now for the fourth. <laughs> of the things we need to say and do. Is it the truth? Is it true? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So as we leave, be safe, be well, be involved, be a Rotarian, and our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>